So in this video, we'll talk about the different types of fMRI experimental designs that are commonly used uh, until this day. And those include block designs, uh, which historically is one of the first uh, types of designs that was used. It includes slow single trial designs, slow multiple trial designs, and fast event-related designs. Event-related designs um, focus on single events and they alternate between different types of, of um, well, conditions, let's say, showing just one single trial that may be uh, the decision in a trust game and then followed by another single trial that may be the decision in a control risk type game. So block designs are historically the most, uh, the first used ones, um, and they are basically illustrated here. So we have different events. Let's say this is the presentation of a face, of a happy face, and this is the presentation of a neutral face. And we were interested in regions that are involved in happy face processing relative to neutral face processing. Then we present the face event multiple times after each other for the period of 30 seconds. Let's say a face is presented for one second, followed by one second of, of a blank screen, followed by another face for one second, and so on within this 30-second uh, block. So we're basically blocking um, the presentation of one particular type of stimuli. This is then followed possibly by a null event and followed by another trial uh, block with different types of trials of the same um, category. And this would be in our example here, neutral faces. And then followed again by um, happy faces and so forth. And you can randomize obviously the presentation um, of the order of the blocks. So in block designs, we chunk together events of the similar class, of the similar type, um, and then compare the hemodynamic response for this entire 30 second period um, in one condition to, that to a hemodynamic response for another 30 second period in another condition. So there's a historical reason why block designs were initially more common than event-related designs. Um, and block designs are still used because they have some important advantages over event-related designs. Uh, but the reason for this is basically because uh, researchers extended from their experience with positron emission tomography studies, which required longer task blocks um, and the, due to the administration of a radio ligand to the participant. So again, what we have here is in a block design, we have a condition that is considered constant throughout a task block of let's say 30 to, to 90 seconds. So this can vary. In fact, you can go up to two minutes, but that is not ideal. So a 30 second task block is probably, um, it depends on what you want to study, but it's probably a common version of the of the block design. And then within this within this block, we present a stimulus such as a face every two seconds for about one second, just as I described earlier. The timing of this can be can be varied, obviously, uh, depending again on on what you expect the hemodynamic response to be like, um, and what you think is optimal for your for your experimental design. And one conditions that is typically used in the in the block design is a rest condition but we'll go through this in in a second so the reason why historically uh, experimenters started with these types of block designs is due to pet studies utilizing these types of task blocks but also because uh, it was known that the hemodynamic response was slow so that um, we should have a long interval between active on conditions and sort of passive off conditions or different types of tasks that we were interested in to allow the um, hemodynamic response function to return to baseline, right? So we know that the HRF is, is slow like this, uh, that it rises to threshold after a stimulus onset here at zero seconds, it takes about six seconds to, to rise to threshold. And then we need a lot of time to let it go back to baseline at about 20 seconds here. Um, and block designs seem to be uh, ideal to, to take care of, of this slow hemodynamic response function that we're dealing with in, in fMRI. Now let's look at some 
potential block designs. So let's let's assume we want to compare brain activations related to processing nouns versus brain activations related to processing verbs. Are there specialized brain regions that pro pro process either of these types of um, well grammatical constructs? And one possible design would be to use simply alternating blocks of nouns and verbs. So task A is nouns, task B is verbs, nouns, verbs, etc. This would actually be a design that's relatively optimal for determining which voxels show differential activity, right? So we, we, can, we can increase detection power using this kind of, um, of design. So if we're just interested in showing um, activity related to nouns versus verbs, so we have a control condition of verbs versus nouns, then this is a design we can use. But we have some downsides here. We have no information about voxels that are active for both. And we will have no information about voxels that are active for a single condition isolation. So this will, this task design here will only allow you to make the comparison task A versus task B and task B versus task A. We don't know if there's um, a process uh, we cannot identify a process involved in just processing words in general. Um, and we cannot identify information about uh, just processing nouns or verbs. For this, what we need to do is we need to have a control condition. It's called rest here, but it could be any other type of control condition um, that maybe even better than just looking at uh, a blank screen. It could be looking at jumbled words, for instance, jumbled letters to control for the visual activations. Um, this will then allow us to do what the previous type of experimental design couldn't. Namely, we can look at task A relative to rest and we can look at task B relative to rest, rest or to control conditions. And we can look at task A versus task plus task B relative to the control condition. So what, what types of regions are involved in processing words in general, so nouns and uh, verbs. So this gives some advantages. It has some disadvantages. Namely, we have less repetitions of task A and task B in the time that we have to do the experiment. Instead, we have these rest periods that are interspersed in between each of the tasks. Um, this is an approach actually that's commonly used in a region of interest um, sort of approach. So if you're interested in um, identifying all voxels that are more active in task conditions compared to rest conditions, then you would run task A plus task B relative to rest. So this would be your first statistical contrast. And then the, the regions that you identify, you can see whether there's differential activation for task A relative to task B in those sort of task general regions that you identified in your first contrast. Um, you can then look at in, in subsequent analyses um, how they differ basically for nouns versus verbs in their activation patterns. So to summarize what, what I discussed before, when we uh, add a rest condition or a control condition, if you will, then we have some advantages. We can look at the joint activation of task A and task B. We can look at the um, relative to rest. Obviously, we can look at task A versus rest and task B versus rest. So we get more information. Uh, but the drawback is we have a decreased ability to detect the effect because we have fewer alternations, which limits our detection power. Now, when it comes to the control condition, uh, as I said earlier, this may have uh, different forms, so it could just be a fixation condition. But if we want to control for visual activations, we might add viewing non-letter patterns during the control condition. And if we want to go further um, to uh, control for sort of letters being on the screen, we might in uh, include viewing non-words as a control condition. What your control condition is and how it's determined as the experimenter um, depends on what your process of interest are. Um, so let's say what aspect of reading you're interested in when it comes to looking at nouns versus ver verbs. Are you interested in the visual aspects? 
are you interested in the semantic aspects or in letter shapes? This is basically um, what would determine your d decision on what control condition to use here. What do you want to control for and what are you most interested in? Now, coming to block designs, um, we have durations that typically vary from 10 seconds to one minute, and that's commonly used. Uh, we can, some, some studies report two minutes, but that is really too long. Um, deciding what block length is optimal for your experiment would involve two considerations. It would, uh, you would have to consider your behavioral or task standpoint, and you would have to consider the imaging standpoint. Now, when it comes to the behavioral standpoint, it should be chosen, the length of a block should be chosen so that it maximizes, in a sense, the mental processes uh, that are evoked throughout the, the task. Let's think, for instance, of a simple uh, visual experiment where we show checkerboards. That's a very fast um, condition there. So we could probably do with very short blocks in the order of 10 seconds. However, when it comes to studying memory or attention, it would take you or the exp uh, it would take the participants a lot longer to reach that state of starting to memorize things or to reach the state of attending to a uh, specific stimuli and you would want a longer block duration there's also the consideration from an imaging standpoint and their detection power in a sense will be a function of the within and between condition variability and there are two aspects that vary when we um, consider between and within condition variability. One of them is um, the length of the block, obviously, and the other one is the number of repetitions that we can perform with a larger number of repetitions, increasing detection power. So here is an illustration of what our goal is in block designs. We have between conditions variability, which is the difference between the average uh, rest period or the average off period or the average control task period relative to the average signal during um, the actual experimental condition. So that's in the, illustrated here by the red arrow. And then we have within conditions variability, which is the variability in a given task period. So in a given rest period or in a given uh, experimental task period. This is basically the um, the two um, statistical moments underlying a t-test. So we want to maximize between conditions variability and minimize within conditions variability to have the highest possible detection power. Uh, so within a, within a given region uh, within the brain to have the highest possible difference between between conditions and within conditions variability. This will give us the highest chance of detecting active signal. If the noise gets too high, which is the within conditions variability, then obviously this gets difficult and our functional SNR is reduced. Moreover, if the between conditions variability gets too low, because we include too many repetitions, I'll show you this in a simulation in a second, then uh, we would also uh, decrease our functional SNR. So let's have a look at some simulations here. So this is really showing how detection power, so our ability to, to increase our functional SNR in a sense, depends on these two aspects, namely um, the length of a block and the number of repetitions of a block. And you can see that as number of repetitions increases, um, what happens is we can no longer go back to baseline, right? So you can see that the signal no longer saturates here at the eight seconds mark. So it looks like a 50 second or a 10 second uh, block length might be ideal from a signal perspective, but it might not be ideal when you consider what, you, what type of mental process you want to study and what type of task you use. But you can clearly see here, there's a, a large increase if we have a 15 second block and then a, a rise, uh, uh, it falls back to, to baseline afterwards. So this gives us a large between condition variability here. If you go down to four seconds, then the signal no longer has a chance. So if we have four second blocks and four second rest periods, the signal no longer has a chance to go back to baseline and sort of saturates here. And even worse in the case of two second conditions. So that means you lose between condition variability uh, at, shorter, um, at shorter block lengths. But you, you gain uh, 
a larger number of repetitions, which obviously is is um, also powerfully helps uh, detection power. A second thing that needs to be noticed is that another trade-off is actually the correlation between the length of a block and scanner noise. And this is something that at 40 seconds, we're in the domain where uh, the frequency of our signal will correlate with the frequency of, our, of scanner noise. And this is typically uh, a problem because we will apply filters in, in the uh, analyses that will well decrease the influence of uh, scanner noise. And if that's in the same frequency domain as your uh, signal from the experiment, then obviously these filters will reduce that signal as well. So that's a problem. So to summarize block designs, block designs are simple, but they're very powerful. They're useful in a large range of studies, but it depends on what your goal is in your study. They can be shown to be optimal designs in some cases, uh, specifically when you want to have the largest power to detect significant activation, then they're excellent. So if you want to determine the location or, uh, within the brain or the, of, of a, a novel task, let's say, then um, these types of designs are, are most powerful. As we discussed, detection power depends on two aspects, namely the between conditions variability and the within conditions variability and the difference between those. And obviously that also is related to our discussion of functional SNR earlier. What is terrible, however, is the estimation. One of the things that we cannot do is recover the shape of the hemodynamic response function to a single event within the block. And this is sometimes uh, desirable for, for experiments. For that, we need event-related designs. The reason why we can't recover this is because basically the signal to a single event within a given block, so to a single phase, uh, plateaus in response to multiple stimuli. Um, and that can be a disadvantage if you need to estimate the shape of the HRF. But most importantly for neuroeconomics, the types of experiment we are interested in are simply not possible uh, and cannot be, they, they cannot capture the types of uh, mental processes we're interested in in fMRI, uh, in, in neuroeconomics. So if we, let's say, want to study the neural correlates uh, of subjective value and how it changes on a trial by trial basis, which is a very common approach, or if we want to use model based fMRI, then this cannot be done in a blocked experiment, in a block design. Obviously, because we need the information of each single trial, and we need to see whether there's a change in the bold response for each single trial as we change the value across different trials. So there we want event-related designs, and that is what we'll discuss in the next video.